everybody. Hope that uh, you can hear me or see me. Uh-oh, let me go fix this. Unmute. Okay. Everybody there in uh, uh, Twitch TV land. This is actually my first uh, Twitch TV regularly scheduled broadcast, if you could call it that. Um, but here, let me if I adjust my camera so I'm actually looking at you. There we go. Um, I just wanted here to talk about my first uh, show, shall we say, is uh, about resurrecting code from the dead. Now, many of you are aware that I am currently contracted by In Exile to bring back the trilogy that I wrote, uh, Bart's Tale, for the Apple IIGS. And I did Bart's, I'm the one who programmed Bart's Tale 1, 2, and even 3 for the Apple IIGS. However, though, um, the 2GS version of Bart's Tale 3 has an interesting story in the sense that I was in the middle of working on it as well as doing a port for Wasteland when the word went down that uh, because we released Battle Chess and Neuromancer for, um, as a publisher through Activision, that Electronic Arts declared war on us and decided that they won't let us use our own IPs anymore which is the main reason why there was no Wasteland 2 or Bard's Tale 4 released back in 1989-1990. And a project I was working on, which was Bard's Tale 4, became Dragon Wars. <laughs> Go figure. But, um, oh, hi Ravenworks. I have no idea what the, uh, the time delay between when I say something and when you say something. I mean, again, this is the very first time I've done this kind of thing, so there will be some growing pains. But um, the one thing I wanted to talk about in this uh, Twitch TV, and yes, I am recording this, so that hopefully I'll be able to put this up later on um, so that uh, people could go ahead and, and see this later, is that I wanted to let you know that during my course in the past two weeks that I've been working on the Bard's Tale Resurrection um, is that I found all of my archives for most of my Apple IIGS games I've written in history. So I've been cleaning them up and with the help of the people known as Brutal Deluxe I was able to get some compilers and stuff running on the PC and the Mac that would allow me to compile all my Apple IIGS code and be able to run it on an Apple II emulator and get it to run on this little sucker, the real thing. Now this is my Apple IIGS. This is the IIGS that I used to do all of my um, uh, all my Apple II games. I mean, um, the whole story behind this was back in 1986, 1985-86, somewhere in that time frame. Um, Interplay was two years old. I had already released uh, three games. That was Mind Shadow, Tracer Sanction, and uh, Borrowed Time. And I was working on a new game called Task Times in Tone Town for the Apple II when we got the word at Interplay that there was this new project called Project Cortland from Apple. And that Project Cortland was the Apple II GS. So they gave me a Apple II. It looked just like an Apple II. But when you open it up, the motherboard is like, that ain't no Apple II. Um, but after I started working with it and talking with the people at uh, Apple DTS about it, it became really apparent that um, this was going to take off. This was going to, you know, it had the uh, potential to even usurp the Macintosh which of course now we know in history Apple was really afraid of that and you know in the late sorry in the late 80s early 90s Apple went out of their way to destroy their own product line because the Apple II just was that good let's do a little unboxing video this is the Apple II GS it's freaking heavy i mean this thing weighs about almost 10 pounds, and there's a reason for it. Because normally an Apple II GS weighs three pounds, or maybe maybe more like five pounds, I think more like five pounds. Well, let's, here's my Apple II GS. You can see the back of it. And a little cable sticking out, there's a reason for that. Let's pop this sucker open. Uh, here's a lid. And, there's the inside of my Apple IIGS. 
Now it's shown some weathering because this machine was the this was my actual I think it's my second 2GS that I had because actually my third because the first I used was the Cortland prototype. Then later on, I got the uh, up motherboard upgrade from my Apple IIe. Um, but I really got a 2GS1 signature WAS editions somewhere around 1986. And that machine, I worked with it for about a month to, no, sorry, about two months. And with a guy named Russell Lieblick, and we worked on a breakneck pace to c convert the game I was working on, Task Times in Tone Town, to the Apple IIGS. And we were able to get the game done uh, before uh, they shipped the IIGS. And as a result, when the IIGS was on store shelves, you could buy Task Times in Tone Town with a 32 voice audio track because I've spent, I've, I'm an audio programmer as well. And I worked with Russell Lieblick and we came up with a music soundtrack and I was making the driver as he was compu composing the music. Um, and in, I remember there was a, an intense week. I was actually working in Russell Lieblick's office with this 2GS, uh, with a, an earlier version, um, and uh, writing the soundtrack for Task Times in Tone Town. And you know, when, we, when people were hearing the music, they're like, a computer is making that? An Apple II? <laughs> well, of course, years goes by. About, no, about a year and a half later, that's when the ROM 3GS came out. And that's what this one is. It's a ROM 3. Inside, I have in here a sound card. It's a equivalent of a mocking board. I use this to do uh, music drivers for my Apple II games because some of my Apple II games actually use the mocking board. This is a Zip GS accelerator. Um, this one was actually modified to run at 14.7 megahertz. Um, I had to use uh, cooling. I had to use. I actually got spe specifically sampled parts from the Western Design Center because I had a reputation at Interplay of having the fastest GS known to man. And I was doing all these hardware mods, including working with the people at Zip. In fact, I found all my, uh, the source code of all my Zip tools uh, that uh, I wrote to manage the Zip chip GS. And the next card, this one, is my high density floppy drive card because I plugged this into an external floppy drive, which I actually have. I found it, uh, which allowed me to read the uh, 1.4 megabyte floppy disks. Yeah, 1.4 megabytes. Big deal. But back then, that was huge because I was able to read and write PC disks as well as Mac disks using my 2GS. And then, of course, the last card here is the um, inner drive, uh, hard drive controller card, which I partially designed. Um, this card is a 16-bit IDE controller card for the Apple II, which plugs in to the special... I'll show it to everybody here. InnerDrive 40. I was one of the designers of the InnerDrive. It's a... We were able to take the Apple II power supply, which used to take the whole bar here, and we re made this new case and put a power supply that only fit this part right here. And here is an enclosure for a uh, two and a half inch, uh, or sorry, a three and a half inch hard drive. Of course, back then, hard drives came at 20 megabytes, 40 megabytes, and if you really spend a lot of money, you can get an 80 megabyte drive. <laughs> but this GS that I'm holding in my hands is the two GS I used to write Bart's Tale 1, 2, and 3. Wastelands, Crystal Quest, uh, Out of This World, uh, Ultima One, and in fact, on this hard drive is all the source code to it. Now I've already pulled a hard, I've already pulled a hard drive out and got the data off, so that's all sitting in my purse force repository right now, which is something that I wanted to show um, a little bit of. I'm going to go ahead and switch screens now, and from the switching the screen, yes, 80, a red pwn put down 80 megabytes is all you need, and I'm like. At the time, 80 megabytes was like, you've got 80 megabytes. What are you going to put it all at storage? Well, let's put it this way. Let me show you. I'm going to go over to switching the desktops. This is the my main uh, dev machine. And let me close up some of these windows here. This is the 
source code to Space Ace. It is a game that I ported back in 19, um, was it 1998, 99, and in here is the source code to the game. I'm going to pull it up. This is the actual source that I wrote back in uh, 1988. And this is, this code was, the reason I did this port was because the game originally was written on, um, by another company called um, ReadySoft. And their version that they shipped didn't run on my hard drive. It, you had to run it off of the floppy disks. And I'm like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. And I have written games in which I've had no source code. So I went through the object code of the game and I created it back in the source. This is, and then I rewrote the whole thing so that here's an Apple II GS emulator. There's Space Ace. Here's all the data files. And let me go over to the actual code that it built, Space Ace. Now, unfortunately, this emulator is uh, scanning the floppy drives, so it's right... There we go. I didn't bother changing uh, any of the uh, graphics inside the game. But there it is, running. Now, of course, I have to press... Let me see if I can play this game here. Amp score. There's four ship. Ah! Homing. Yes. All right. Right. Left. Right again. Oops. Missed it. I suck at this game. But then again, I think the uh, because the simulator is not that good. Um, I when I play this game on the 2GS, it works perfectly fine. I'm gonna quit out of it. But let's look at this folder here. And you can see there's all these audio files, death files, and then the space ace file. Well, let's look at the files as they truly are from source code. Here are all the assets of the game. There's all the movie files. Here's all the death animations in the files. And this is a Python script because I modified this to work now with the latest Burgerlib uh, build system and the burglar build system is all python driven so i'm going to i'm using code right now only just because it shows syntax highlighting but part of my development system is i i still use these days uh, code warrior so i go ahead and open with integrated and when i edit my source i usually edit with this because i'm just so used to code warrior but nowadays, I've been switching a little bit to code because of syntax highlighting. But what this code does is it just simply copies the files from one folder to another. See, copy the data files for space safe for the Apple II GS. And to, put, to see how things have changed, here's the binary folder. This is the actual copy of the folder that I put onto the II GS. When I tell it to, cop, to do the build, it takes all these asset files, Creates a bin folder, because like I'm going to delete the folder. Then I'm going to, here's a command line. So here's assets and source. Uh, in fact, I'm going to do a clean, recursive clean. So now I have not built anything. When I built this game on the 2GS, it took approximately, I think it was about a minute for me to process all the art, assets, data, and code. Well, nowadays, build recursive builds all the folders. Done. I mean, of course, with the make system, it's already done. But there's all the game. It's all built, all data, and even the executable, which is sitting right there. There's the icon files or space ace. There's the actual code. And there's the uh, resource fork. And then what I would do is I'd use a program called Apple Cider, which would then copy all these, including this wacky file name so I can get the file types, put it onto a disk 
Apple 2GS disk image, which then I can either copy to a real 2GS, or in this case, copy to this emulator, and I would run the game. And yes, there they are. Bard's Tale, Destiny Night, Ultima, Task Times and Tone Town. I mean, here's Ultima 1 that I wrote. The music was done by a friend of mine, Tony Gonzalez, who passed away a few years back. So if I re-release this game under Windows, I will definitely, uh, in this game, I would dedicate it to his memory. But, you see, continue with a previous game. Burger Becky. Grave of the Lost Soul! Woohoo! Yeah, I can just quit this game. Quit. And then here's Bard's Tale. This music uh, was written by, um, I believe it was, it was Charles Dean. No, it was um, Dave Warhol. That's who did it. Um, and I did the music driver for it. There's uh, Task Times in Tone Town. Now, this game is the first game that was ever released on the Apple IIGS. And of course, I'm going to kill myself. Death of Disagreement for all those who chant the unholy word. It seems the game has ended. Try again? No. <laughs> Yep, Ineos. So anybody on the tw there on uh, Twitch land, do you have any questions? Because I am watching the, um, the feed as it comes in. So if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. But back to how this game works, since I showed you some of my games. I'm going to focus on Space Ace. Now, the reason I'm focusing on Space Ace is because it is my intent that probably within the next couple of days, I'm going to put this up on GitHub so that everyone out there can go ahead and take a look at this code, see how I built it. Um, to build some of this thing, you will need some of my tools, uh, which is like the Burgerlib build tools, like make projects and build and so forth. And those you can either download through Kitchen Sync or you can download through, um, because I'm distributing them on um, Python, so you can do easy install. And build's gonna actually be renamed to Burger Build because unfortunately I don't want to have a name conflict with the word build and it's just a Python script. But um, I'll, I'll include the instructions on how to do all that and so forth here, but I'm also gonna have to release the 65816 assembler and um, that's pretty much all you need to build um, in this case, because it's the A65 for assembly 65 and to convert this to 2GS format, you have to use uh, Apple Cider. Now, there is something you may want to ask about this right here. What is this B3DB03 bullshit? And that is on the fact that well, on the Apple 2GS, files had file types, and you have aux type. Now, the file type and auxiliary type is that if a file has no type, it's just a file, the file type is zero, it's a byte. If the file type was, um, in this case, B3, 
that tells you that it is an Apple IIgs um, desktop application. The aux type is essentially extra data. Um, so like when I build the icon, let's go here to the icon. The icon is file type CA, and that tells the operating system that this is an icon file. 0000, zero, zero, zero means that I don't have any aux type to it, so really it's to be ignored. This file is the actual executable file generated, so there's the file type. But you notice this one, it's B3DB03R. That tells Apple Cider that this is the same file, but this is a resource fork, which contains the info, the version. So it's stuff from the old Macintosh, where you have the resource files, resource forks, and so forth. So when you copy this onto an Apple IIgs disk image, it actually takes these two files, merges them into one, and then that is what's shown on the Apple IIgs desktop so that it will operate properly. These other files are just raw data files compressed in a format that's easy for the Apple IIgs to play back. And in your particular case, here's a source code. This source file creates the icon. Since I do not have any icon makers or stuff like that, I felt it was better for me to just convert it into a source file. If you look carefully, there's Space Ace's face. You can actually see it in the text. And then there's the mask. And then this is a small icon, which right now I just had a little tiny square and really that's it because I was kind of lazy. And then here's where this assembler spits out the file in that uh, file name, spaceace.icon. And then here's all this. This, is, this will actually be put out onto um, GitHub when I release this. Then the next file it builds is spaceace.res. This is the actual fake resource fork. The problem is, is at this point in time, I do not have an actual resource compiler that runs on a, a PC or a Mac. So as a result, I kind of had my hands tied and had to fake it. Um, I have a friend of mine who's investigating uh, porting over one of the old Apple IIgs tools that does this for me. Finally, let's build Space Ace itself. Since I have to build this as a linkable uh, executable, I have to use a different version of a building instead of just build it and spit out a binary file. On the Apple IIgs, I tell it, give me the file type, or you know, here's the name of the file I'm going to write out. The type of the file is an application. This is telling me that I'm going to use express load, which is something that was introduced with GSOS, I believe it was six, uh, five or six. It's a, a way of loading in an Apple IIgs file relatively quickly. And then, because of a quirk in the way this assembler works, you can only link in one assembly file. So it's kind of like a, a monolithic file where it includes all the other things I need. And that's where it builds Space Ace. This tells me that um, I don't need any extra data after my code. It doesn't use any special memory. It doesn't have any alignment requirements. And this is the label and the segment names. And the, what goes on is an Apple IIgs files is that you're limited to 64K per segment, so you create as many segments as you need to get around the 64K boundaries, and then when the application is loaded into memory, it puts each 64K chunk into some bank of memory. You don't know where at runtime. The, the loader will then fix up the bank numbers, and then it will execute your code. So this is something that you had to deal with when writing any Apple IIgs application. Yes, the original 10-hour EA loading screen. Yeah, Rept owned. Um, at least I got it so it only loaded in a few seconds. Well, next, after all this stuff, let's go over to the source code. This is, again, spaceace.a65. And here's where I just tell it to start up, 60-bit mode, the tools, Here's the code to set up. Now, as you can see, I wrote this code, and it was commented just like this in 1989. The only thing I had to do with this code is I had to make a few minor changes with stack frames in order to get it to compile under the PC compiler that I've got. But other than that, what you are looking at is exactly what I wrote back in 1989. 
And again, I wrote this code. Like, here's the code for the Insonic, so I can upload it onto the Conic DSQ1, play the audio. Um, in here is the palette drawing, so it can update the palette. Here's the Heartbeat IRQ, which synchronizes the game to the timer interrupt, which is why no matter how fast your CPU is running, the game runs at a constant frame rate. And I had to make sure I did this because I was running two GSs that were running far, far faster than the one, shoot, get my local storage. I didn't even notice that was, I had a typo there. I should fix that. <laughs> um, man, oh, that's a typo that's been there since 89. That's a 25 year old typo. Damn, I'm old. Oh God, I'm old. 25, I just realized I wrote this 25 years ago. Ah. <laughs> oh. But um, at the end of the code, this is actually the data which tracks the keystrokes. Like, do you press ref, right, um, which movie to play, a bunch of other specific pieces of data. And then this one, put, includes the rest of the code, which is shapes. This source file is that back then, Shape files were so primitive that it was actually more efficient just to grab the shapes and shove them into your source code. Here's the source code to the um, the digits for the scoring, number 0, 1, 2, 3. This is actually the bitmap values that I put onto the screen. And then here's the graphics that says your mission is over. In fact, if you look really carefully, you will see it says game over. Here's where it says press, uh, you know, press start. I'll press zero to start, and this is just a bitmap. In fact, I forgot, was it? Uh, yeah, it's 16 bytes by nine, so. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, I think I was using zero as a. No, maybe it's compressed. Yeah, I don't, I'd really look at what sort of formats I was using to draw this with. Because I don't know if I remember doing this as two bits per pixel or what. But anyways, this is all the um, the code that actually draws. You know, this actually stores the um, artwork for press zero to complete. Mission is over, and uh, the digits. So there were no digit files. There was no art files. They were actually hand typed in. But that is some of the things that I had to do with back in, um, let me go back to, back to my web feed. That gives you a, a little glimpse of some of the things that I was doing back in the 80s when I was writing code for the Apple IIgs. In fact, uh, everything was done using the Merlin assembler, a lot of tenacity, and many, many late nights with burgers. Mm -hmm. So does anybody here have any questions? Yes, you cannot win. <laughs> Let's see, someone wrote, your code is about as commented as mine is, sparse. Uh, okay, someone asks, uh, uh, Summer, I guess that was Mr. Somerville, how does the CPU handle switching banks? Um, well, on the 65816, you actually have a 24-bit address register. Um, the register is called the, uh, there was the K register and the B register, there's two of them. And in fact, I could show you that code right now. Because when you initialize an Apple II GS app, uh, program, let me go here. I'm going to go back to the desktop. Here we go. When you execute the code, this instruction I'm highlighting, which I may have to zoom in. Let's see here. How do I? Let's see, can I open this in code? Open with code. There we go. And let's see if I can actually zoom in or increase the scaling. Let's see. Zoom in. There we go. Zoom in is control plus. So zoom in, control plus. There. That makes it a lot easier for the home audience. There we go. When the Apple II GS begins, this is the very first instruction right here. Set my bank. And I'm going to zoom in some more again so people can read it. For the 24-bit address bus, 
the Apple II GS really is running on a 16-bit program counter. And the program counter is that the upper eight bits is kind of hard-coded. Think segment registers on the um, PC. So the segment register here is called K. When I push the K register, pushes that one byte onto the stack, and then I pull the, that into my B register. The B register is that whenever I use 16-bit addressing, this magical rep register will tell me what bank to actually get it from. And then here's where I store my stack, store my direct page, so I know where they are for later on. But now, when I'm executing this code, it will be executing all in the 64K bank that I'm actually running in. Now, if I do jump subroutine, JSR, that's the old Apple II 16-bit um, subroutine calls. And those subroutine calls will only be done in the same code bank. But there is an instruction called JSL, and that's long. This address is actually going to be put in the uh, byte stream as a 24-bit value. So this instruction takes four bytes long. The, uh, the call instruction, which is 6C, not 4C, and actually, oh, it's a... Uh, what was JSL? Because it's not 20. 20 hex was JSR. I think it was 6C or 6... I actually looked it up. I remember. Or was it EO? Anyways. Um, so this here is going to push three bytes on the stack, which is the return address and the bank, and then load all three bytes for the program counter and jump to that call. That's how it does interbank jumps. And then when you, ex when you return, you instead of using RTS, which only returns on the same bank, you use RTL, which pulls three bytes from the stack to do long calls. And that is how essentially you can either choose, just like the old DOS's um, near mode and far mode, it's very much that same way. So hopefully that ends, uh, answers your questions, uh, Chuck. Now, next question was, how similar was the 2GS Finder to the Mac Finder? Oh my, they were very similar. In fact, when the Apple IIGS came out, the Finder was all done in color, which back at this particular year, when the IIGS was out, the uh, Mac was still black and white. So the, on the IIGS was the first Apple product that had color quick draw, it had a color-based Finder, and it had colored icons and everything. And as you can see, when you're looking at it, this really gives homages to the Mac OS Finder circa 1985, 86, you know, Mac OS 1 through Mac OS, I think, 7. And in fact, a lot of stuff in here was adopted for Mac OS 7. Now, one of the things I loved about um, the Apple IIGS operating system was something that still, even to this day, people aren't really doing, is the concept of FSTs, File System Translators. My Apple II GS, if I put in a disk, I could read in a Mac HFS disk, a DOS 3.3 disk, uh, High Sierra, which is for uh, CD-ROMs, um, Pascal formatted disks, so you can look, push in your old wizardry disks, and of course, the ProDOS disk, which is the, the main um, operating system of the Apple II GS, which is based on ProDOS. And then Finder data, which is the Finder droppings, which even to this day, you know, the Mac OS still doesn't avoid. It's like they call theirs uh, .ds underbar store. But I really loved using the Apple II GS Finder. In fact, I was using this for so much work for from 1986 all the way up to around 1994. I was still using an Apple II GS long after it was technically dead. It wasn't until then when I started switching over to a PC I started using a PC for development, and it was really around 1996, 97 was around the time when I really started doing all my dev, mostly on a Mac and then later on a PC. Let's see here. Question. And Brutal Deluxe did a great job with Merlin 32. Do you use Cadius? Uh, no, I don't really use Cadius, but Merlin 32 is the compiler that I'm using to build uh, Space Ace. And Dagenbrock's asking, what are you using resources for? Finder icons? Um, actually, I'm using the resources for the, well, I'll just show you. Go to Space Ace. Go to here. And when you go to Space Ace and do Icon Info, oops, I keep forgetting it's only a single click Icon Info. The, this data here, Space Ace version 2.0.1, 
that's a GSOS application, this copyright, that's all in the resource fork. And there's even a comment which basically said it was rewritten by me and that you have to press Q to quit from the game and then please buy the game. Although, of course, I'm certain Reddit is not this address anymore and their telephone number. And I don't even think they give a, they don't think they even care. And of course, this uh, Space Ace picture is I just simply grabbed an image from Space Ace and just converted to an icon. I'm no artist, but that's the best I could do because I did this project all on my own because I just wanted to play this game on my Apple II hard drive. Okay, uh, Chuck's asking, there must be instructions for accessing data across banks. Um, actually, uh, yes, in the Apple II GS, you have an instruction called load a long. Um, it's a new 6816 instruction, and that instruction allows you to load data at any address in memory 24 bits wide. Um, so therefore, you can, if you want to, access memory in another bank, plus, as I'm going to show you in the source code, let me find the, let's see, control F, let's see here, go to find, find all, Okay, first I'm going to show, this is an instruction. Let me actually load this in code because again, people can't really read this. There we go. And view, zoom in, let's see it's control plus, so control plus, let's see. There we go, all right. Let's go over. Okay. This instruction is the instruction which loads from a pointer that's 24 bits. So therefore, I could using instead of parentheses, which only does a 20, uh, sorry, a 16-bit pointer, this does a full 24-bit pointer. So I can have my a code use an arbitrary 24-bit pointer to go ahead and access memory anywhere in the 16 megabyte address space. And like the 65 16 had these instructions like store zero, so I don't have to, I could just zero, zero out the memory locations. Push effective address, which effectively is just to take a constant and push that directly onto the stack. Call subroutines uh, far. Uh, 20, um, for Dig and Brock looked it up, it was uh, hex number 22 is a, a jump subroutine long. But let me find a, um, let's see, where's the find? No, I want, see, where is it, edit? What's the command for find? Control F, there you go. Okay, I want load A, L, there we go. This instruction, load A long, instead of using a uh, 20, or sorry, a standard 30, sorry, 16 bit address, this you give me a full 32 bit address. Now in here, I'm actually hard coded to specific hardware registers in the Apple II GS to read the Insonic ports. So here's where I'm loading it from the Insonic, which is this is shadowed, and then this is writing it to the actual C10C. Um, and I'm using the E1 register ports because it's a higher speed memory. Um, let's see, Snoobinator, hello. But here's where I'm storing into the, the Insonic. Now, of course, I would probably have to do a whole talk on how the how to program the Insonic ESQ1 on the Apple II GS, because the way it works is it was only four ports. One port is the register, another one is for read, another one's for write, and another one is for uh, enables. And that's it. And you use that those four registers to actually upload to the 64K audio buffer and um, program the chip and then tell it to go. But like here's the uh, animation afraid code, which I take it, test the high bit, press, Save the opcode, uh, upload a new palette, um, new picture, fade in progress, blank out the palette. These are all things that I did to get uh, the game running. Any other questions? Shubinator. Okay, Shubinator. Would you ever, did you ever consider releasing your 65 16 version of BurgerLib? The answer is yes. In fact, let me go see if I can find that folder here. Um, source see here and that would be in uh, was it Ganymede 
work files, burger stuff. This is actually the backup from that hard drive. Um, no, actually it's not burger stuff, it's in full CD. And there's Burgerlib 68K. This is the 68,000 version, which was a very early version of Burgerlib. Let's see, where's boot disk? Um, where did I put that? Let me go here. Because CTS ROMs, Arthur, system stuff. Was it? Wow, GS games. Let's see here. Burgerlib, Major Game Code, Alone in the Dark. Let's see. Um, SideQuest. Z80 bridge, my floating point source code. Um, let's see, where did I put that? It's just burger, because I know it's definitely called burger. Well, while it's busy doing that, let's see if there's any more questions here. Yep. I see Dagan's going, squee! Uh, well, Shubinator, the thing is, is that some people run the two. There's actually, I'm going to be at a talk. Uh, I'm going to give a talk at a place called Kansas Fest in Kansas City, Missouri, next week. Um, it's, uh, look it up, it's Kansas Fest. In fact, let me go find the uh, website for it. I'm going to put it up on my page here. Let's see, Kansas Fest. But it's held in Avila College in, um, what's it called? Yeah, Avila College in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. They've been doing it for every year forever. And I'm going to be the keynote speaker in about two and a half weeks. And it's a convention really dedicated to people who are um, avid collectors and followers of the Apple II and the Apple II GS. And there's still like several hundred people who come there every year. Now, granted, I'm only, um, I'm right now just archiving my code, making sure it's building. I'm not actually doing any new Apple II GS development. Um, unfortunately, there's no money in it. <laughs> um, and I need to eat. Um, but the thing, those, is that I do have some of my games in which I'm planning on taking them and porting them, which is what I'm doing in Bart's Tale. I'm taking my Apple II GS of Bart's Tale, porting it over to Windows, so that what you'll be playing under Windows has the same graphics and sound fidelity of the Apple II GS version, which by far is the best version of the original Bart's Tale trilogy. Hate to ask this, but your life's busy, but Sailor Ronco. Well, let's see here. Sailor Ronco, you're asking about that. Well, let me just close these windows. Gee, what's that? Um, yeah, I have desktops of Sailor Ronco. In fact, there's wallpapers and stuff like that. I've been wanting to get back to that, but it's just one where that I've been so busy with everything else. And secondly, is one where that in order for me to do a comic book, I need to pay the artist about 80 to 100 bucks a page. And... Um, but that's expensive, and I would need either a Patreon or something like that because I, I just really right now don't have the kind of money to be able to spend on doing the comic book when I'm literally spending money to do it. Uh, it's not like anybody's paying me. In fact, the comic book that's been done so far was all out of my pocket, and trust me, that was a lot of money. Um, because while I do the writing and I do all the plotting and I do everything, I do everything but draw the comic book. Yeah, about that. Oh, didn't want to mention Sailor Ronco, but yeah, um, I'm the one who created it. Um, there was a guy named uh, Duncan Zillman who did an original draft of a story called Sailor Ronco, and he then just let it go, and then I took over the story, then I wrote a sequel to it, and I just went nuts, and I wrote nine novels in the series. Um, and then afterwards, I wanted to learn how to do writing for comic books. So I used, since I already knew the IP, I went ahead and said, hey, why don't I just practice doing a comic book for Sailor Ronco? And I then hired some artists, and uh, I started doing it. And of course, granted, the first draft of the comic book, um, the art was not so good, and my writing was a bit sluggish. But then afterwards, I went ahead and 
took what I've learned and went back to the beginning and redid like the first three chapters on the new format. It's vastly improved. I just need to be able to continue the story as well as, I mean, I already know how the story ends. I know how every st chapter, I know everything. I just need to write it. Oh, yes, you found the Ace Ventura suddenly seeking Panda and when Charlotte calls. <laughs> Hi there, Pulse Infinity. Uh, it's going pretty well. We're talking a little bit now for, instead of coding, but from Sailor Ronco because that was uh, something else that I did a long time ago, um, which I've been meaning to get back to, but, you know, life gets in the way. But uh, as Fox Hack was mentioning, um, during my years where I was doing a bunch of fan fiction, um, I actually did these two no short novels. Uh, they're more like short stories because they're only like maybe, I don't know, 10,000 words and that's it. But one is a Ace Ventura uh, crossover with Rama One Half called uh, When Charlotte Calls, and which Ace Ventura is hired to capture the uh, pet piggy uh, for, called from a girl named Azusa Shiratori, who thinks this little pig belongs to her, but it doesn't. And the pig is really a human being who turns into a pig when touched with cold water, and so hijinks ensues. And then later on, I did a sequel because it was so popular called Suddenly Seeking Panda, in which the main character, a guy named Gemma Sawatome, has this plot where he converts himself to a panda, sells himself to the Japanese circus because pandas are really expensive, so he gets all this money for it. Then he turns back into a human and leaves, and he's got this money. Well, the zoo is like, we just spent all this money on a panda and disappeared. So they hire Ace Ventura, and hijinks ensue. <laughs> Yes, I'm the one who did both uh, Fox Hack. Yes, I'm the one who wrote all those stories as well as those games. I did a, a sad story based on um, Oh My Goddess called uh, Special Assignment, which is a tearjerker. And then, of course, there's the Sailor Ronco novels. And then I did one which was uh, still unfinished, but I needed to get to. It's called Hapo Sai's Happy Wonderful Life of Doom, or shortly called Hapo Sai's Life of Doom in which I wanted to write a story in which it was all about sex, but there was no sex in it at all. So there was a character in Oranma called Haposai who's a pervert. I mean, this is canon. He's, he's a freaking flaming pervert. And he dies and goes to hell, and the demons there decide that they will make him the demon of perverted sex because every demon who becomes a demon of perverted sex dies of pleasure within minutes. And so they say, well, you will turn him into demon of perverted sex. He'll die in a few minutes. But the problem is, is the guy's a virgin and he has absolutely no idea what to do. So they're like, how could you be... What? And hilarity ensues. <laughs> Which all the demons and stuff... I mean, you really have to look, because I think it's actually one of my best written works so far. But um, I... The novel is about 50% complete. I know exactly how it goes and how it ends and so forth. I just need to get to the time to actually finish and write it. And then, of course, I had a, uh, another one, which is only like one-third finished, called Independence Day, which is Rama one-half in Independence Day. But in that story, I wrote it actually more serious. And, you know, characters were going to get killed. And there were – and the people were going to get tortured. Um, I was uh, – because each time I write a novel, I want to expand my skills in writing – because I already nailed comedy, I nailed comic book heroes, I nailed um, sex comedy, if you can call it that, in which it's still G-rated. Funny that. Um, actually, it's more PG, I would say, because there was too, so much innuendo in there. I mean, I so much innuendo. But, the, uh, but Independence Day was my first to do a hardcore science fiction. Um, but... Um, I've taken all those learning of all those writing skills, and that is where Dragons of the Rip came from. Because I've always, ever since I did Bard's Tale and Dragon Wars, I've been wanting to do another, do another RPG. But, however, back at Interplay, they put me on all these console games, and even though I kept asking to go on to an RPG, uh, Interplay was really focusing on this game called Stonekeep. And I wasn't really involved in that game at all, and I'm like, well, why am I not involved in that game? But you know, they said, well, we want you to do 
Out of this world for Super Nintendo. We want you to do track meet for Game Boy. We want you to do the sound drivers for RPM Racing. So I did all that stuff. But I always wanted to get back to RPGs. And then now, uh, 15 years later, um, you know, we found our own comp game company, Old School. And that's when I said, well, you know what? I've got this game idea and concept and so forth, and I want to actually make it real. And that's where we're going to be doing a Kickstarter in about uh, two or three weeks because uh, we're still preparing everything for the Kickstarter, the introduction video and everything. And um, the whole point is that it's going to be, what if I did Dragon Wars 9? I mean, every game I did, the, I always pushed the technology. I kept making it better looking. The graphics are, uh, the interaction's much better. The um, scripting's better. Um, but what if I just kept iterating over it? And that's what I've been doing. I'm, and I've got all these sketches and st things saying, this stuff worked, this didn't. This worked, this didn't, so forth. And then that's where, um, you know, and that's really what it's the, when I, uh, Shubinator, when I said Dragon Wars 9, I'd say, like, what if? What if I did Dragon Wars 2? What if I then did Dragon Wars 3? Dragon Wars 4? Dragon Wars 5? Because, you know, after all these years, I'd be up to 9 or 10 by now. But what would it look like? What would that game look like? And that is what we're doing. Um, it's a you know modern RPG done uh, dungeon crawler style, and uh, the mythos and everything is really wonderful. I mean, I have myself you know doing the writing and so forth, but then I have uh, Janelle coming with character designs and mm -hmm. and just other other people have been working on the Caspian Preeb, uh, Delaney King. Uh, we've got and a huge list of uh, writers that uh, D&D, &D, TSR writers that I ha can't really announce yet but uh, you'll be very pleased when you see the roster of people who are going to be writing scenarios for Dragons of the Rip so hopefully people will be donating money to it so I can actually eat and do the game I've always wanted to do for about 15-20 years <laughs> yes, Nectar of the Gods mmm <laughs> Well, anyways, I only schedule a maximum of one hour for my little uh, podcast here. So, and I'm getting close to that one hour. So, I'm going to be wrapping up for any last minute questions. So, if anybody there has any last minute things to say, ask, or something, I'm going to start calling this a wrap. Now, I will say in the meantime is that I would like to be able to do this like once a week. And I was wondering if 5 p.m. on Sunday is a good time. Um, if this is more inconvenient than let people make notes or send emails letting me know what would be a good time for uh, doing my live podcast. But other than that, um, I hope. Uh, oh, uh, question. Uh, Re Retro Pwn is asking a question. What is the 2GS emulator you use and what's your favorite one? Well, on the PC, the only one really uses kegs because it's the only one that really runs on the, the, uh, the PC that I'm actually seeing it's any good and can run the um, Ensonic ESQ1 to a level that satisfies my needs. On the Mac, though, I run um, Sweet 16. Um, it's a 2GS emulator written by a friend of mine, Eric Shepard. And when I'm using uh, on the Mac and just testing my application. Now, generally, I don't do any development on a 2GS emulator or anything like that. I just use it just to do a quick test to see if my applications are running. Um, when I want to check out the application running on a real thing, I actually put it on a real McCoy. But for um, real development, I mean, my intent is to take this games after I fix the code, make sure it builds, and I just put it up on GitHub. And then at that point, I'm like, yeah, you know, here, just look at history. Really, it's about all it's good for. Um, some select games, like in this case, Bard's Tale, I am going to be backporting them to Windows and converting them all into C and making them run under you know modern operating system. They'll still look like the same games. I'm mean, not going to really do any uh, graphics enhancements or anything like that. But at least you'll be able to play them without an emulator. And that's essentially what I'm doing with... Um, uh, the Bard's Tale Trilogy for an Exile if you uh, pledged for Bard's Tale 4. Uh, let's see. Shubinator. In the game industry, if someone wanted to break into the field a long time, never got an opportunity to, how would you open to studios taking him in or taking him on board? Well, that answer, it's, it, it's very, very easy, but it's not what people want to hear. And that answer is, to break in the industry, you got to work hard. And when I say work hard is 
learn on your own. Download the Unreal Editor. Make a game yourself. Download, um, what's it called, Visual Studio Express or Xcode or just GNU if you're using Linux. I mean, there are tools out there for free. Money is not a limiting factor. You know, as long as you have a computer, that's all a computer and an internet connection, you can learn how to make games. The question is, is that how willing are you to learn on your own? And now the best thing to do is GitHub is your friend. GitHub is, you know, stay away from SourceForge. SourceForge has now been infested by trolls. Just stay away from there. But GitHub, you want a game. Download the source code to a working game. There are dozens and dozens of games that are right now up on GitHub. Download them. Build them. Play the game and then go into the source code and start changing things. Like, oh, and then as you change, you'll start to learn saying, oh, if I did this, I could change this. Oh, here's the code that does the, you know, the hopping. Let's change that code. You will start to learn how programming works by modifying other people's code. And in time, especially when you look at uh, how to program in C tutorials or how to program in C Sharp or whatever language you prefer, um, you will start to learn how all these things work. Well, Shubinator says, like, I've never had anyone even remotely interested in what I've done since I've never actually been hired by a king company. Well, the way you get hired is that you get to be good and you do mods. Like, what gets my attention? If I was to get a resume, like I'm hiring somebody, and I get some resumes on my desk, if I look at the resume and I look at the name, I don't know most of the people. I just don't. But one of the first things I do is I look at the projects you've worked on. Now, what you could do is you could go on to some open source projects that are out there, like, um, God, what was the one? Black Mesa and so forth. You know, there's several people that are doing mods. Uh, like there's Skyrim mods all over the place. There's uh, Team Fortress mods and stuff. If you are an artist or a modeler, create 3D models and put it up on Polygon or something. Let people see your work. If you are a programmer, go join one of those mod teams and start contributing to it. Because if the game's actually really, really good, then you're going to be attached to it. Um, examples is like Portal. Portal was originally designed by a small group of guys or, and a girl and some girls over at, I think it was DigiPen. And it was a very crude prototype, but it showed promise in which the whole game mechanics was shooting portals and solving puzzles. And of all the games that were being shown, it was the best. And Gabe Newell says, hmm, how much for the team? And hired them on. And then with the assets of uh, uh, Valve behind them, Portal was born, and there you go. But that started life, not at Valve. It started life as a small team that had a great idea for a game. They put it together. They, it was really cool, and now they work at Valve. Now, someone said, um, yeah, you need to prove yourself. Chuck Somerville is correct. Prove yourself with examples of your talent. No one's going to say, oh, um, I'm a great programmer. Um, hire me. I'm going to say, you know, I've got 30 people who are good programmers, and some of them I happen to know because I've seen the work they've done. What makes you more attractive than anyone else? You know, did you write a Tetris clone? Did you write um, mods on Black Mesa? Uh, did you write mods for this? You know, these, joining a mod team also is free. But one other thing also is you have to understand, making games is hard work. TV shows, stuff, really makes it trivial. They think putting together a game is something I could put together in a weekend. That's bullshit. Absolute, unfiltered bullshit. Every one of those games I've written, I mean, now you look at me and say, like, but Becky, you've written over 250 games in your career. That's 30 years. That comes out to about eight games a year. And yes, I am very prolific. But that's only because I know how to recycle code. I know how to port it quickly so I can get games on different platforms. I know how to do all these things, but I didn't do this overnight. It took, you know, my story starts off where I got an Apple II computer, and oh boy, I, I'm going over my time limit now. Got myself an Apple II computer, and I taught myself um, how to program an Apple II. And it took, I mean, when I first started programming Apple II, I was pathetic. I was absolutely, utterly pathetic. But after two years of just hitting on it and hitting on it and hitting on it, cracking software and breaking everybody's protection, but 
I was good at it. I learned how to be a good programmer. And then after another couple more years, I then um, was started making games for uh, hire, which is in 1982. Because I started coding in 80, 78, but I didn't really start getting my first job until 82. That's four years. Four years of me just playing around my computer. I was just a kid at in my you know bedroom and so forth, just figuring all this stuff out. But I never stopped. You need to do that too, and you have to accept the fact this is going to be hard work in order for you to build these skills because they're not just, nobody's going to just give them to you. It's not going to be something where, oh, I have an idea for a game. Um, I could put it over in a weekend. Nope. I mean, you could do a prototype in Unity in a weekend, maybe. At least that'll test your ideas, but will it be a fish shipping game? Uh, not by a long shot. <laughs> so, I just want to be realistic. You got to have a lot of drive. You got to have ambition. You got to have a lot of eagerness to learn. And if you have that, you got a career ahead of you. <laughs> yep, basic scheme, list, whatever. Well, if you want to learn a language, my, you know, I always recommend C plus plus. There's always C++ programmers. Number two, C Sharp, because if you know C Sharp, people who are programming Unity will want to talk to you. Um, after that, I would recommend at least to break into programming Python, because that's, a, that's what I build all my uh, scripting system is in Python. Um, the other languages like Objective-C and stuff like that, they're, if you want to specialize, those are things to do, but really emphasize C++. C++ um, and once you learn, and the funny thing is, once you learn one computer language, the others are pretty trivial to pick up. Anyways, I do have to get going. It is now past six o'clock. Is one past uh, my uh, one hour uh, that I allotted myself. So I will see you all again next week, uh, Sunday at five o'clock. And I hope uh, you know. Hope to see you then. Okay, everybody. So talk to you later. Bye.